In the back? Quiet? Thank you. Um, so thank you all. Thank you all for coming. My name is Chris Segoyan. I'm the principal technologist uh, with the ACLU's Speech Privacy and Technology Project. Can, ever, can people in the back hear me okay? Yeah? Okay, cool. Um, so I have a fun talk, I hope, for you all today um, about how I learned to love cyber. Uh, so before I start, um, it's been a really cool year for the ACLU. Um, I work with a team of lawyers. I advise the lawyers at the ACLU who do most of our uh, surveillance, both national security and law enforcement litigation. Um, and, and I know that for many of you, you may have heard of the ACLU, but you may not realize uh, how, we, how we work on the issues that you probably care uh, very deeply about. So just a couple of things we've worked on in the last few months that have really borne fruit. Um, about a month ago, the Supreme Court ruled that cell phones are uh, a protected space when it comes to searches incident to arrest, and so now the police need a warrant to search your cell phone. That was a big win, uh, something we participated extensively in. Uh, we won a major decision at the 11th Circuit down in Florida. Um, holding that location data, cellular location data, whether historical or real time, is also protected by a warrant, and so the government cannot just simply call up the, com the phone company and get your data. And then I'm sure many of you watched uh, Ed Snowden's talk yesterday, um, and my boss Ben uh, has been advising uh, Ed for uh, for some time. Uh, for some months in, in the last year. Uh, and so that has been um, one of the more exciting things that we've all gotten to work on. Uh, so, uh, you know, we're really, really happy how things are going so far uh, on that particular set of issues. But uh, Ed Snowden's revelations have really sort of opened things up uh, in many ways on many fronts on surveillance. And, and you'll really get a taste of that um, going forward. All right, so let's go back in time. Let's go back to 2009. Five years ago, it was a very, very different world for those of us who care uh, about encryption, who care about surveillance, and who care about the extent to which the government can engage in massive dragnet surveillance. Uh, the world of SSL or, or TLS uh, was not a good one in 2009. Uh, of course, the technology existed within your browser. Uh, probably you didn't have uh, the most up-to-date version of TLS implemented in your browser, but your browser did support um, uh, HTTPS, uh, and unfortunately, most of the sites you were using, with the exception of financial sites, were probably not using it by default. And so unless you uh, either sought out some hidden configuration option uh, or you typed in the URL manually, most of your data was going to be going over uh, networks without any form of, form of encryption. Uh, this of course meant that both content and non-content uh, could be monitored by the NSA. And I think if there's one thing that we've seen uh, in the last year, it's really that massive bulk surveillance um, uh, is easiest when it's performed passively, when the government can just collect and monitor unencrypted data uh, at choke points around the world. And so back in 2009, most of the big US technology companies to whom we entrust our private data, Google, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Microsoft Hotmail and Yahoo, all of them sent their users most sensitive inf information over the internet in plain text. Uh, we knew how to protect this information, but in 2009, these companies just were not turning on crypto by default, uh, with the exception of the username and, pa username and password uh, during login. Uh, this is from a blog, po a blog post um, that Google published in 2009 when they first made available an option, a configuration option to even um, require SSL in the future. They said HTTPS can make your mail slower, your computer has to do uh, extra work to decrypt all that data, and encrypted data doesn't travel across the internet as efficiently as unencrypted data. That's why we leave the choice up to you. And so this is, this is mid-2009. And this is Google's uh, Gmail security team, uh, on one hand, announcing a good thing, announcing that people don't have to manually edit the URL every time they want to go back to Gmail in the future if they want to do so securely, but on the other hand, clearly putting the responsibility on the individual user to enable this obscure option. And the option was, was called use SSL, question mark. Um, there was no label there. There was nothing suggesting that this was a security feature, nothing describing the importance of it. Um, and it was the 13th 
13 of 13 configuration options after the vacation auto away message, after Unicode settings. I mean, it was the least important setting uh, in, in the order of, of the, uh, the interface. And so, for obvious reasons, most people probably never enabled um, this setting. Uh, and so, in many ways, the fact that these companies um, were not encrypting data meant that the NSA um, had a wealth of data at their disposal. Uh, the, if we've seen anything in the last year, if we've learned anything from the, from the Snowden documents, it's that the biggest problem for the NSA hasn't been how to access the data, our data, it's been how to parse all the data, how to, how to cope with data at that scale. Uh, in many ways, uh, you know, the NSA has really just been gorging themselves uh, on our sensitive and private information, and this really has been made possible um, because so many of these large companies have done so little to protect our private information. Okay, so 2009 was a bad time, um, but that was five years ago, and things are slowly starting to get better. Over the last, couple, uh, over the last three or four years, and particularly in the last year, um, the big tech companies have really started to lock things down, and in particular to lock down the connection between your computer and theirs. Uh, of course, this is the result of Ed Snowden. Without Snowden's disclosures to the press, um, we would not be having this debate. Uh, companies would not have been forced or shamed into updating their security, and so uh, it was the result of disclosures by, by Ed and then careful reporting um, by a few news outlets uh, and the journalists working for them who really, really dug in um, to find things that mattered and then I think in many ways to, to put direct pressure on these companies to, to tweak their security or in many ways to significantly enhance their security. Uh, this slide when it was first uh, published by the Washington Post, the SSL added or, or removed here um, slide of, of course upset many people famously um, several Google engineers uh, were said to have or wrote on their blogs, you know, fuck those guys. Um, obviously, there are people inside the Google security team who don't appreciate um, the NSA evading the, um, the Maginot line security systems that they designed. Um, and so this was one example of a, of a program by the NSA or GCHQ um, that, that, that definitely led to tech companies improving their security. In this case, it was Google, Twitter, and other companies deciding that finally they needed to encrypt the data, the data center to data center links within their infrastructure. Um, this story got a lot less press. It was uh, also won by the Washington Post, uh, the reporters Bart Gelman and Ashkan Sultani. Um, and in this story, they revealed that one of the most interesting targets for the NSA were address books and buddy lists. So information about who you contact, in many cases, is even more interesting than what you're saying to them. Um, I'm just going to sort of zoom in uh, to the, the chart on the bottom right-hand side. Uh, what, the, what the post revealed was that Yahoo and Hotmail uh, users were having their address books collected by the NSA an order of magnitude more times uh, than Google or Facebook. That seems like a pretty interesting data point, and of course the reason for this is that uh, until January of this year, Yahoo wasn't using SSL at all uh, for any of their services. Um, so Yahoo eventually fixed things, and, uh, and Microsoft has fixed things too, and Google has um, not only continued with their, their moves towards SSL, but they've uh, enabled perfect forward secrecy, they've tweaked the algorithms they're using, um, and so in, in many ways, the upgrades we've seen have really been as a result of this news coverage. Uh, in March of this year, or sorry, May of this year, uh, a bunch of operators of Jabber servers or XMPP servers all got, all got together and said, you know what, it's 2014, we should be requiring encryption by default for the transit links between uh, our users and servers. Uh, and so they all turned it on. Um, and that was a really big, big thing because now the government, current, our government, or in fact any other government, cannot just sit on the wire uh, and watch instant message traffic go back and forth. Uh, and so we're really seeing this trend um, towards encrypting data in transit uh, and towards encrypting data between the consumer and the server. Um, this has really been helped by, uh, by some of the Snowden stuff, but there have also been other efforts. Um, naming and shaming can work uh, particularly well uh, when the practice that the company is engaged in is largely indefensible but not known to the, to the general public. Um, a few months ago, Google published this really useful transparency report um, revealing which of the servers they interact with, the mail servers they interact with, and which of those support Start TLS server-to-server -server email encryption and which of those don't. 
Uh, and the, the changes that have happened in just the last month or two since Google made this data available have really been night and day because now we can name the companies who haven't turned on this basic option. Uh, and so just in, in the last month or so, Comcast, Apple, um, Microsoft Outlook, Craigslist have all turned on TLS uh, for their mail server to mail server connections. Um, and they probably wouldn't have done this had Google not made this data set uh, available. So this again um, has been really powerful. It's probably not really that much of a point to encrypt the connection between your computer and Google if Google is then going to send the, your emails plain text between Google and Yahoo or Google and Hotmail. And so naming and shaming um, has also been uh, quite effective. Um, I know that gamification uh, is a pretty silly concept and, and is rightfully mocked uh, by many people in the tech community, um, but it works. Uh, and one of the most interesting and useful examples here is the SSL Labs project by Qualys, uh, where they give letter grades to server operators um, based on their SSL configuration. Uh, are they using uh, TLS uh, you know, 1.3? Are they using um, perfect forward secrecy? Are they protected against particular attacks? Um, do they have the right configuration options enabled? And I've seen server operators like continually tweaking their configuration until they get that, that, a, that a grade or even better, the A plus grade. Um, this works. It doesn't cost uh, any money to run this test. And um, if you administer a server or you work in an organization and you have contact to your IT department, I highly encourage you to go and check your own site uh, against the SSL Labs um, test bed and see what your own letter grade is. And if you're not getting an A, an a plus, like my organization currently does not have, um, I encourage you to talk nicely uh, to your IT department and, and offer them uh, nice things until they agree to finally get you that A-plus score. Uh, so when the PRISM slide was first made public and uh, Google's logo was, was up there, a Apple's logo, Microsoft's logo was up there, these companies were, were in an NSA slide deck uh, essentially describing how they, they had been forced uh, to collude with the government and, and surveil their customers. That looked really bad for those companies, and, and particularly when it came to their foreign markets, and particularly in Europe. Um, we've seen these companies first deny and then say, you know, we're in a tough situation, um, and then decide that they're going to start talking about surveillance. And they're in many ways talking about how they're making surveillance more difficult and they will push back against requests and they're going to fight where they can and file requests at the FISA court. Um, but this is in many ways the exception rather than the norm. Typically you won't find companies that want to talk about surveillance. Uh, you won't find companies that are going to talk about how they're making surveillance more difficult. You're definitely not going to see government officials for the most part talking about why surveillance is a bad thing. Even when we have uh, progressive members of Congress who are on our side, um, at best we can hope that they will ask for a warrant. At best we can ask that they will hope for some kind of oversight, but it's very, very rare that you'll find a politician who will grandstand and say that there should be data that should be always off limits to law enforcement or always off limits to the intelligence community. It's very rare that you'll find a member of Congress who will say, you need to deploy this technology because the NSA should never get it. That will, will, will probably never happen. Um, but there are many technologies that this community wants companies to deploy that in fact won't just raise the bar a little bit, but in fact raise the bar so high that data will in many cases be completely off limits to the state. Um, and so if we want these technologies to be deployed, if we want Google to turn this on, end-to-end -end encryption on by default, or we want Dropbox to finally start using per-user keys that are not known to the company, um, then an anti-surveillance message is probably not going to be the thing uh, that gets the company to do that. And we're definitely not going to get members of Congress uh, to harass these companies to deploy technologies that will blind the NSA. Uh, and so for that reason, we need a different message. We need to be comfortable with spin, and we need to be comfortable using a message that uh, for far too long we've left to our opponents. Uh, so this is Pamela uh, Jones Harbor, a former commissioner with the Federal Trade Commission. Um, she was probably one of the leading voices of privacy when she was at the commission um, until I think 2010 uh, when she left. This is a speech she gave, her last public speech, March of 2010. Today I challenge all of the companies that are not yet using SSL by default. That includes email providers, social networking sites, and any website that transmits consumer data. Step up and protect consumers. 
Don't just do it some of the time. Make your websites secure by default. Uh, so I've looked really hard, uh, and I think this is the first time any senior presidentially appointed U.S. government official even uttered the words SSL, uh, let alone called for SSL by default. This was a very, very progressive speech um, from an agency that doesn't typically use its soapbox to, uh, that hadn't previously used its soapbox to advocate for these kind uh, of sweeping uh, technical rollouts. Similar, Charles Schumer, the senator from New York, one of two senators from New York, a tough law and order senator. Just a few years ago, Schumer proposed a mandatory SIM card registration law uh, because of the, the threat posed by anonymous burner phones. Uh, Schumer is uh, about as tough uh, uh, on crime as they get, but just in 2011, Schumer wrote letters to Yahoo, Twitter, and Amazon calling on them to turn on SSL by default. He said, quote, Providers of major websites have a responsibility to protect individuals who use their sites and submit private information. It's my hope that the major sites will immediately put in place secure HTTPS web, web addresses. So on one hand, you have these two government officials, senior government officials, calling on companies to deploy technology that will actually make bulk surveillance more difficult. Well, how does that happen? How do we get these people, these very powerful public officials, to use their soapbox to push for the technologies that we want companies to deploy? Well, it turns out the threat that they were worried about um, was hackers. They, uh, they weren't worried about the NSA. Right? They weren't talking about the NSA. If you look in the, the full text of Commissioner Harbour's speech or Chuck Schumer, they, weren't, they were not talking about the Iranian government or the Chinese government. They were talking uh, about hackers at Starbucks. They were talking about the widespread availability of tools that allow people to steal authentication cookies uh, from open Wi-Fi networks and then log into each other's accounts. And in many ways, the thing that made this a front page issue uh, was the availability of this tool, Firesheep, written by uh, a security researcher named Eric Butler. And it, it was about two or three weeks after the New York Times wrote about Firesheep in 2011 that Chuck Schumer gave the speech on a Sunday afternoon and sent these letters out to a tech company. It was the threat of identity theft and petty crime stalking that led to these senior government officials calling for technology that we want companies to use but technology that for the last year we have described as an anti-NSA technology. Now we will never get Chuck Schumer to give a speech calling on tech companies to make things more difficult for the NSA. But we can get Chuck Schumer to give more speeches calling for technologies that make life more difficult for stalkers, for domestic abusers, for criminals, for petty thieves. And if those technologies happen to make life more difficult for the NSA, well that's okay. Uh, but we cannot expect these politicians to, to call for technical controls that actually thwart the NSA's surveillance dragnet. In 2009, um, I wrote a public letter to Eric Schmidt, then the CEO of Google. Uh, the letter was co-signed by Bruce Schneier, by Ron Rivest, the, the R and RSA. 37 security experts, uh, we all wrote to Google and we said, you need to turn on SSL by default. This was about six months before Google eventually did it. Um, and in that letter, again, we didn't use any language about the NSA. Even though, of course, many of us were thinking about the NSA, we used the language of identity theft and fraud and crime. We said, we strongly urge you to follow the lead of the financial industry and enable HTTPS by default. Given the huge threat posed by identity theft, it is vital that Google take proactive steps to protect its users from these risks. So Google did eventually, actually relatively recently after that letter, um, turn on SSL. And when they did it, they, they did it the, the, the same day that they announced they'd been hacked by the Chinese government. Um, and we can have a discussion about whether that was a very cynical move by Google and they were trying to show that they were doing something to stop the Chinese. Um, but what's important to understand, again, is that when Google announced that they were turning this on, there was nothing in their marketing material, nothing in their blog posts about the NSA or the FBI or law enforcement or deep packet inspection by ISPs. It was timed with the announcement of, of the China hack. And so by framing things uh, in the context of threats that US government officials are worried about, we can make it much easier for companies uh, to do the right thing um, 
in a way that we like. Okay, so in addition to that, we should remember we have agencies at the federal level that are there to protect our privacy and our security online. Uh, the U.S. doesn't have a system as robust as Europe where you have, in many European countries and in Canada, you have a single privacy commissioner who at one, you know, on one day is giving, you, giving a speech about Facebook and the next day is giving a speech about the intelligence community violating people's privacy rights. We don't have that in the United States. Uh, the two sort of biggest agencies we have are the Federal Trade Commission and the Federal Communications Commission. And the FTC's mandate uh, doesn't extend to surveillance. It doesn't extend to the activities of government agencies. It extends to activities by companies. The FTC goes after Facebook for lying to you about how they protect your privacy. They go after you know, TJ Maxx for losing credit card numbers. Um, and so if we want the FTC to do things on our behalf, we need to sugarcoat it in a way that makes it palatable to them and, and, and allows them to make statements uh, without making it seem like they are overstepping their authority. By, by the same token, the Federal Communications Commission, they aid the surveillance state. They, um, they were the ones that were required by Congress to implement CALEA, a wiretapping law. They forced the carriers to build wiretapping features into their networks. And so if we make it difficult for them by asking them to, to do anti-surveillance actions, we're going to hit a brick wall. So we need to frame things in a way that are palatable to the two agencies that are most equipped and have the most power to do things to force companies to protect all of our data. Okay, so that brings me to cyber. Um, I know that this term has a, a lot of baggage in this community. Um, uh, I know that for many people, cyber means uh, uh, a potentially embarrassing online conversation with someone who's uh, gender and age may not actually be what they told you. Um, and I know that there is this, uh, there's this message in the community um, that people who say cyber and use it to mean internet security are idiots. Right? There, we have this, this idea that real, real experts talk about information security and idiots in DC talk about cyber. In the same way that we would like the word hacker to mean people who tinker, people who experiment, people who push, uh, push boundaries in technology, not criminals. Uh, but that ship sailed a while ago. Um, there, there is a cyber industry in DC. Um, and they don't, they don't care about the fact that you think the word cyber uh, is stupid. You may think that cyber means uh, age, sex, location, uh, but for the people that matter, <laughs> for the people that matter, cyber means a massive threat, a threat that they don't understand, um, and a threat that requires massive resources, legislation, power, uh, and compromise of core values. And we cannot change their minds. We can have that fight. We can stand there and try and convince them that cyber is a stupid word, or we can focus on the actual core problem. Thank you for that one person who's a realist. <laughs> so many of you may of course know James Clapper, who famously lied before Congress, uh, when describing what the NSA wasn't doing. Um, Clapper gave a speech before Congress just a couple years ago, 2013, last year. He said, when it comes to the distinct threat areas, our annual intelligence community worldwide threat assessment this year leads with cyber, and it's hard to overemphasize its significance. In previous years, terrorism had been the number one threat that DNI identified as a threat to this country. In 2013, cyber was the number one threat that DNI identified. Again, we can have a debate about whether they know what they're talking about. We can have a debate about this word, um, but they've already put it at the front of the agenda. He added, these cyber threats put all sectors of our country at risk, from government and private networks to critical infrastructures. So when you have the top intelligence official in the country going before Congress, and saying that this cyber thing, this cyber thing is a massive threat, uh, members take note. When you have uh, large defense contractors taking out subway advertisements in DC, talking about zero days, um, the congressional staffers who ride the subway to work, they take note. 
right? And so, again, we can sit here and say, from our ivory tower and say they don't know what they're talking about, they're not even using the right words. Uh, but members of Congress on a daily basis are hearing from people that they trust, people who have legitimate sounding resumes, who've worked in the government themselves. Uh, they're hearing from them that cyber is a massive threat and that they need to do something about it. Um, now, uh, this is, of course, is Keith Alexander, until recently the director of the NSA. Um, those of us who are cynical, I think many people in this room are probably quite cynical, uh, particularly after the last year, uh, those of us who are cynical might say, well, they're just hyping the cyber threat because they want to make lots of money. Keith Alexander famously, as soon as he left the government, started talking to financial firms and offering them cybersecurity consulting advice for a million dollars a month. And so we could say, look, these defense contractors, they want to get rich. Cybersecurity is the only part of the defense budget that's going up right now. These guys see an opportunity to, to make some money, and they're, uh, they're ginning up the threat. Right? They, just want, uh, they just want to make money, and the way they do that is by spreading fear, by going to Congress and saying that the sky is falling, that we're under attack. Well, so what? Every day... Uh, a lobbyist is going to a member of Congress or a congressional staffer and telling them that there's a cybersecurity threat, that, that this is the biggest threat our country faces. Every day, congressional staff and members of Congress open up the newspaper and read stories about massive data breaches in which hundreds of millions of credit card numbers are stolen, confidential intellectual property, trade secrets, stuff is walking out the door. And if the response from our community, whether the technical side of the community or the civil liberties community, is to say that there is no cyber threat or that the cyber threat is overhyped, we won't be taken seriously. Because the fact is, there is a cyber threat. We just don't like the terminology that they're using and we question their motives. And so in many ways, this cyber stuff uh, is like a train. It's a train that's moving really, really fast and there's a lot of weight behind it. Uh, and if we try and stand in front of it, we're going to get squished. Um, but the thing is, uh, we can sort of direct the direction of the train. Uh, and the reason for this uh, is the people who are getting the briefing. This is Ted Stevens, the now deceased uh, senator. And uh, Ted Stevens very famously um, gave a speech in which he called the internet a series of tubes uh, and instantly became a, a global laughingstock. Now, I live in Washington, uh, and I go to Congress on occasion, and I talk to staffers. Um, and my guess as to what happened is that some, someone came in to give Ted Stevens a briefing, uh, and they described the Internet as a series of pipes. Um, and then an hour later, when he was talking to someone else, or giving that speech, it sort of got flipped in his brain. And you can sort of see the connection between pipes and tubes. It's, it's pretty close. And for a non-technologist, for a non-tech expert, grasping that concept is, is pretty impressive. Um, and so here's how it works. You have these lobbyists, um, many of whom are former military or government officials who know nothing about technology, and they're now working for defense contractors. Um, and they're going to Congress every day, they're going to the executive branch every day and talking about this cyber threat. And the people they're talking to are congressional staffers, most of whom are 25 years old with a political science degree. Uh, or members of Congress who don't have any technical background, and they're talking about the cyber threat. And so you have two people having a conversation, neither of whom actually understand the technology. And so what that means then is that a successful lobbying pitch by a ex-general now working for Booz Allen or Raytheon or Lockheed is merely to leave the member with the impression that the cyber threat is big and that maybe their company's tools and solutions are, the, are, are, are what they need to buy or what we need to give money to. But they never get into the weeds. And so this is an opportunity for us. If we try and convince Congress that the cyber threat is not real, we will, we will lose. If we say that the cyber threat is real and the solutions that we want can solve the cyber threat, then we win. Right? There are many, many, many technologies that we would like that would in fact make it more difficult to steal credit card numbers, that would in fact make it more difficult for the Chinese government to steal proprietary information. Uh, but those technologies would also have the side effect of protecting our civil liberties and protecting our information from massive bulk dragnet surveillance. Um, and so for far too long in Congress, there's been this, um, this, this decision that, that policymakers have been stuck with. 
They weigh, on one hand, civil liberties, and on the other hand, they weigh national security and public safety. They're told, you know, okay, we're going to allow wiretapping without a warrant, but on the other hand, we can stop this ticking bomb. And so all you need to do is just pass this legislation that gives these good people the authority to do what they need to do to keep us safe. And it's really difficult to go in and talk to a policymaker and tell them that that's a bad idea, um, because if there's another attack and they didn't sign onto that legislation, they're going to lose their next election. But if we tell them that the solutions that are being pro proposed by the FBI, the solutions that are being proposed by the NSA, would in fact make our network less secure, that would in fact make our network more vulnerable to attack, that retaining data is a target, The data retained for the intelligence community becomes an instant target for hackers. If we tell them that, then suddenly it becomes a debate of security versus security. Security from the local criminal against security from the cyber threat. And then suddenly the member is stuck because they know they want to keep this, this country safe, but they don't really know which threat is more serious. And that's a much better position to be arguing from uh, than, what, than this sort of uh, moral high ground of civil liberties that you know are going to be thrown under the bus uh, the next time there's a terrorist attack. So for years, um, Bruce Schneier and others have been talking about uh, the four horsemen of the information apocalypse. Uh, I'm sure some of you have, have heard of this. Um, these are, of course, uh, our drug dealers, uh, terrorists, uh, pedophiles, and kidnappers. Um, but there's a new uh, horseman in this club uh, that isn't yet in the picture. Uh, and his name is Ugly Gorilla. Um, so the Chinese government has been demonized in Washington to the point that they are just as bad as terrorists and drug dealers and pedophiles. Com U.S. companies are, not, are bullied into not buying equipment from Huawei or ZTE because of this threat. U the U.S. government risks upsetting trade relations with the Chinese governments in order to send a message uh, about how upset it is uh, about the cyber actions of the Chinese army. And so usually, the people in the civil liberties community, the people that I work with, we are on the receiving end of the four horsemen, right? So we are arguing in court about the importance of the Fourth Amendment and why the government should get a warrant. Uh, and on the government side, they're talking about how if the government has to get a warrant, this, this sexual predator might, you know, be, might not be, get charged or we might not stop the next terrorist attack. And so usually, those of us who care about civil liberties are defending ourselves from attacks from accusations that we will aid the four horsemen, that we will aid the bad guys. Uh, this cyber thing actually gives us an opportunity uh, to use one of the four horsemen, or now the, the five horsemen, for our side. Right? The things that the, that the intelligence community wants actually make us more vulnerable. They make our systems weaker. They make our security worse. Uh, and that gives us a position of moral authority and technical authority from which we can really uh, defend uh, a lot more of what we care about. Okay, so what this means then, Tor is not an anonymizing service that hides you from the NSA. Tor is a cybersecurity technology that protects U.S. private information from foreign threats. <laughs> Silent Circle and Red Phone, the two technologies that use the ZRTP uh, protocol, these are not secure technologies that blind the NSA or or wiretapping proof technologies that keep the FBI out. They are cybersecurity technologies that stop foreign governments from stealing U.S. secrets. <laughs> the Whisper Systems Tech Secure app, which I hope all of you are using because it's finally the first easy to use encrypted instant messaging solution um, that I can actually get my family members to use. It is, this is not a tool for terrorists or criminals. This is a cybersecurity solution, and we should all be pushing cybersecurity solutions. All right, so repeat after me. Cyber, cyber, cyber. All right, you don't have to, actually. But really, you get the idea, right? 
In the same way that Giuliani is 9-11, 9-11, 9-11, we should be cyber, cyber, cyber. To anything that we don't like that, that, that promotes more surveillance, the answer should be cyber. Because everything that the NSA has proposed to date on the Hill in Washington, D.C., whether it's information sharing, whether it's data retention, whether it's backdoor, uh, wiretapping backdoors and communication networks, they're all bad for cybersecurity. Um, but we haven't been pushing this, this message hard enough. Uh, and so we really need to go on the attack. The entire technical community, the civil liberties community, we need to develop an affirmative cybersecurity agenda. Um, and what I mean by that is if you ask the public interest groups, if you ask technical organizations what they would like on privacy, they have a list of things. We want to pass legislation to require a warrant for email access. We want to require that the government post transparency reports. So we have a list of things. If you ask them what we would like on IP or on patents or on so many issues, we have a wish list of legislation of affirmative changes. But to date, if you ask us what we want on cybersecurity, it's please don't pass CISPA. We don't like the legislation that the NSA has proposed. And our community has done a really bad job to date of pushing back uh, and calling for things that will actually improve cybersecurity. And so the problem with this is that if, you, if every day or every week you go up to Congress and you say, we don't like what you've proposed, and every week there's a new data breach, eventually you get ignored. Eventually they, just, they, they dismiss your, your concerns and they, and they say the threats are too important, we need to do something. But if we go there every week and we say, here's a problem and you're not fixing it and you're making systems less secure, then we at least bring something to the table. Then we have a place a, a legitimate place at the table. Um, and so there are things that we should be calling on that are so obvious, that are so indefensible, um, that we can really put the government on the defensive. So for example, 10% uh, of US government computers uh, apparently are still running Windows XP. This is, this is laughable, and this, this would actually lead to a significant and real improvement in cybersecurity. It's of course impossible to protect a 15-year-old operating system from attacks, a 15-year-old operating system that hasn't been hardened, that doesn't have any new uh, defenses. Uh, this is something that we are slowly adopting at the ACLU. It's taking a little bit of time uh, because as a, as a civil liberties group, we've never thought about things in this way. Uh, and I, my position didn't even exist until two years ago. So we, we now have two uh, full-time technologists who are working uh, on issues like this. And so last year, we filed a, a complaint with the Federal Trade Commission, and we said that it was disgraceful that consumers are not getting regular security updates for their Android devices. Um, people shouldn't have to wait six months or a year uh, for a security fix, and if the carriers don't want to give people updates, they should get out of the way uh, or let people out of their contracts so that they can get a secure device. And you, know, you may not agree about this particular approach or this particular issue, but what's important is that we're now pushing an agenda. We have a list of things that we want the government to fix that will make us more secure, and that more importantly won't violate our civil liberties or require that we give up any of our privacy. And so cyber is this huge opportunity for us because all the technical knowledge is on our side. Right? We understand this stuff way more than the folks on the Hill and the Intelligence Committee uh, in, in the White House. There just aren't many technologists in the government. Um, and so we really have this position of, of technical authority from which to push back and to tear apart all of their proposed cyber solutions. We haven't been doing this to date, and, and I really think this isn't something, pardon me, that, this, that the civil liberties community can do by itself. We need the input of the security community. We need the input uh, of the hacker community because you, you all are far closer uh, to where the action is and you have ideas um, for really what things that will make a big difference while also not requiring major investments of resources or requiring that the government do s significant things that they pro probably cannot do. Uh, so thank you very much for your time. Um, I think I have about five or ten minutes for question, and th there's an ACLU table out, uh, outside. So I don't know how the mic thing works here. Is there a mic? There's a mic over there? I can't see anything. Um, so if you want to ask any questions or, or rant for preferably no longer than 20 seconds, um, please come up to the mic. Uh, otherwise. Um, you can find my contact information online, and we are always looking for suggestions for things that we should be working on uh, that are sane. Hi.
Can you hear me? Mike? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Um, there used to be an Office of Technology Ass Assessment to advise Congress. Do you think that it's worth, I think it's been gone for a while. Do you think it's worth um, a community effort to try and advocate for its reinstatement? So what, what she's saying, there used to be an Office of, of Science and Technology or something along those lines uh, in Congress that provided non-biased technical advice to members of Congress, non-partisan, non-biased advice. Uh, and when Newt Gingrich came into Congress, he shut it down because he said it was a waste of money. Um, so what, what it essentially means is that there are very, very few to no techn technical experts working in Congress. Most of the people there uh, have political science degrees. They are not technically skilled. I think it would be a great idea um, if Congress hired technologists. Um, I was the first technologist that the Federal Trade Commission ever hired. And then they hired several more, including some of my friends. And then they appointed uh, a chief technologist, which is now a, a senior computer scientist on rotation um, through the agency. I think the more technical experts we get in DC, the better. Um, it's always a good idea if you can have uh, people who know what they're doing advising policymakers, so that that way when um, a lobbyist comes to them and says, this great idea will fix everything, they can say, well, actually, it's, it's not that good of an idea after all, and it'll break the internet. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Chris, great presentation. Thank you so much. Isn't this really about protecting American intellectual property? And isn't that another thing that can help unite people that we need to strengthen? Uh, the security systems um, across the board? Uh, I, I'm not going to um, walk down the road of IP laws. Uh, I, I suspect that my opinions are probably not, not the same as uh, many folks in Congress on, on IP issues. But I will say that given that we have a multi-billion dollar industry complaining about IP theft, if we can say that security technologies will protect IP from being stolen, let's go with that uh, and, and use them to, to our advantage. So yay for three women asking <laughs> questions right off the bat. But um, no, my question was, I think, well, it's not really a question. I, I just think that it's good to have messaging, and so I really appreciate that. And I also appreciate then supporting tools. But you, I feel like there's a missing piece, and we have to go further, because you know, using tools and protecting ourselves, you know, citizenry um, of countries who are engaging in you know, cyber warfare against one another, which is actually what's going on. I mean, it doesn't really protect us from, doesn't really protect against DDoSing or, you know, pretty high level espionage or the zero days. Like, so these are problems that are going to always exist um, and they're only escalating at this point. So I think just beyond saying, you know, making a case for, you know, using, uh, making the internet infrastructure and, and end user tools more secure, we also have to be talking about um, including uh, civil society voices in policy making in a multi-stakeholder model, which is what internet governance is, but it's definitely not, you know, that's not how things are done um, in military and or law enforcement, right? So I, I just want to say that I think it's, it's, a, it's a good starting point and, and to think more long term as well about how um, the sort of larger and maybe more root problems can be solved. So I will ag agree and acknowledge that that there's this strange disconnect between the problems that are identified by members of Congress and the solutions that they propose. So you will have in the same statement uh, a member of Congress talk about identity theft and stolen credit cards and then talk about um, how, their, how their bill is really important to cybersecurity, but the information sharing legislation they're proposing, which essentially allow, allows companies to share information with each other or with the government without fear of lawsuits, privacy lawsuits, that won't really do much to stop someone from, um, from breaking into your computer and taking your information. Uh, and so I, we do have policymakers sort of calling out identity theft as this threat, a threat they, they say that they, are, that they care about, but then nothing that they're proposing um, really addresses that. And so that, that gives us an opportunity to say, well, hang on, we have solutions to this identity theft problem. We have solutions to this issue of 50 million credit card databases getting stolen, or databases with credit card information getting stolen. All right, my time is up. Thank you all very much. I appreciate it.
doesn't work. upstairs because I'm ready to strike stuff. <laughs> um, it's a uh, oh no, well, it's try ten point. Uh, it's just not saying the external monitor. So yeah, it might not have the drivers for it. Did you test it before or no? I've, I've displayed lots of stuff on the drivers. Yeah. seen that work but it would be mine let's try it
Thank you. So what I, I think we should do is find, focus on finding another laptop. Because I can if you have a laptop and do you have any laptop that works reliably? Oh. No, cool. Go figure out the uh stuff I need. intro and then it's all yours. Alright. Thanks. Welcome. Alright you maniacs. Where are we at? Holy cow. Getting towards the end. I don't know if there are any other marathon runners in here. I feel like we just did one. So um we're getting towards the end. This is the last talk in sort of the regular program. We have some closing ceremonies happening in here. I believe, huh? I believe that we'll have the, um, uh, the Olsen room in the back simulcast with the partitions open for the closing ceremonies because a lot of people are still here. So um, stick around for that. Stick around to clean up a little bit. If you can't stick around to clean up a little bit, clean up a very small little bit and take your own personal trash and, and uh, send it in the back. That way someone else doesn't have to do that. So um, without further ado, this is uh, Peter Eckersley with Privacy Friendly Hypertext. Hello, Hope. Uh, hello, New York. Thank you for staying for what I think is the last non-closing ceremony talk of the conference. Uh, I've had an awesome weekend. I hope you guys have too. Um, I am here to talk about an EFF project that is dealing with a different kind of surveillance uh, from the kind we've been talking about a lot this weekend. Of course, EFF works on government surveillance, uh, defending against wiretapping. Uh, but today, uh, I'm here to talk about the actual designed nature of the web and hypertext, uh, the fact that it's spying on us all of the time, uh, and that it's time to do something about that. Uh, so we have this project uh, that we launched in alpha a few months ago. Uh, actually, tomorrow morning, we're going to be going beta. So you guys get a preview uh, of the new cool features and stuff that we're doing tomorrow. Um, 
in this little program called Privacy Badger. I want you all to remember that URL. It's really easy to remember. Uh, you can install this thing uh, during the talk, after the talk. Probably not during the talk because you'll get distracted and you'll tell me about the bugs in the software and I don't want to know about them until afterwards. Um, you can file that stuff on GitHub. But uh, you know, I'm not just talking about Privacy Badger and this piece of software. I'm actually telling a story, I think, about the, the architecture of the web and the architecture of hypertext and the way that privacy does or doesn't fit into that. Um, so if you go back to the days before the web, we enjoyed um, a thing that we, we often took for granted, which was the right to read in private. Uh, you could walk into a library and walk between the stacks and pull out a book and start reading it. And unless there was someone cute further up the, the aisle looking at you, uh, watching what you were doing, for the most part, no one would know what you chose to read. Uh, you could walk into a bookstore and purchase a book in cash, uh, and other than the person at the checkout counter who didn't know who you were anyway, um, you could take that book home, put it under your bed, and no one would know uh, that you were reading about whatever it was, anarchism or Islam, um, or, or secretly you were conservative and you didn't want anyone to know that. Um, today, that right is gone. Uh, if you choose to read uh, anything using the modern medium of reading that we've invented, the web, uh, the chance, it, chances are uh, one, two, three, half a dozen, a dozen other parties and companies are going to end up knowing what it was that you were reading. Uh, we can indeed still go to the library, except by doing so, you're, you know, adopting, you're, 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 you're accepting a significant amount of inconvenience compared to what we now have as our best way of reading. So yes, you can, for the time being, until they close, let's try and keep them open, uh, we, you still have those physical libraries. Uh, but, you know, we've just lived through something that was actually the equivalent of the Gutenberg invention of the printing press in terms of the degree of transformation um, and um, awesome improvement of writing in terms of the way it works, but we didn't bring privacy with us. Anyway, throughout this slide deck, I'm going to have some pictures of badgers because I can't help it. Uh, and, you know, we have the sad badger because we've lost the right to privacy. Um, and we've built this new medium, the World Wide Web. It's an amazing achievement. Um, but along the way, we failed to build it with privacy uh, in the design. Uh, and so the web you know, has these creepy eyes that are spying on us. Um, and any time you get too sad, just think about cute badges and we'll stay cheerful and we'll make it through. Um, but if you look inside the design of the modern web, uh, this, this privacy problem is woven in really deeply. Um, do you want to have basic hypertext functionality? Do you want hyperlinks? Do you want embedding? Well, you just also built referrer, post, and, um, and get tracking. Uh, the pages you're, you're looking at just disclose to other web servers the fact that you are uh, looking at the, the source page when you embedded an image. And of course, we don't just use the web for hypertext. Uh, we use it for user interfaces. So do you want a stateful user interface that remembers what buttons you clicked and actions you took a moment ago? Well, you need cookies or some other state tracking mechanism. Uh, and those turn out to also be the, the index um, uh, identifiers that are used in these giant databases of our reading habits and online activities. So the awesome functionality we wanted is completely entangled with the design uh, of a surveillance system. Do you want offline web apps? Um, and modern browsers ha support all sorts of nifty features for this, like little databases that uh, they'll store for an application with, it, with its uh, records and, and state. Now you have super cookies, so even though you thought you blocked your cookies, uh, there's this other thing that can be used to store identifiers and send them back to sites uh, so they know who you are. And okay, so you know, we have these problems, and, and what does it mean in practice? Um, it means there are a lot of people uh, who end up knowing what you read. Some of them uh, know because in a more fundamental sense, they are the platform on which you are reading. They are the first parties in your address bar, uh, whether that's at, you know, Google or Facebook or Amazon. You, people do so much through those companies that they just get to see 
uh, a giant window into your life. Um, it's people who've kind of surreptitiously snuck onto your computer. Um, you've installed some app, uh, some browser uh, toolbar or something. Um, here are a bunch of these examples. They're really deceptive sometimes. Uh, you end up with this thing on your computer. Probably not people in this room, but your relatives, when you go to help them uh, with their buggy computers, you'll find them full of this, uh, this stuff. Um, and it's tracking them. And then uh, these guys, the third parties on the web, are the ones who really take advantage of those properties of hypertext I was talking about before, where they've woven themselves into the page, and just by loading it and all of its, its sub-resources, you end up telling them what you're doing all of the time. So um, this is the situation, and I'm going to focus in this talk on these, these kinds of trackers. So I, I want everyone, you know, along the way, let's just try and keep a vision of, of what, we, what we want here. We, we want the beautiful uh, infinite library of the web, the infinite library of hypertext. I just really enjoy looking at pictures of beautiful old libraries, actually. Um, so here's another one. Um, and of course, the one we have on the web, or the one we aspire to having, also has a lot of cute pictures of, of animals on it. Um, uh, they, they, they occupy, a, you know, a prominent adulted place there. Um, but how is this beautiful thing funded? Uh, how is it, is it built? It's built around all sorts of ghastly things we don't want to know about, like uh, you know, deceptive ads for antivirus software that they're actually malware themselves. Um, you know, going to search for Firefox, and what you find at the top is an ad for the Yahoo version of Firefox that probably comes bundled with some kind of toolbar that uh, you'd rather not know the details of. Uh, all of these weird wet ads that um, maybe some of us don't see uh, if you run an ad blocker, uh, but a lot of humanity, the vast majority of humanity is seeing this stuff, clicking on it, uh, and this is the underbelly that's paying for uh, a large fraction of the current web. Uh, and probably in our beautiful infinite library, we'd l rather it was funded by something uh, more principled. So how did we get into this mess? Um, I don't think anyone exactly knows the answer. You know, Collectively, when our species stumbles into a mess, it's usually the product of many forces. But a couple of interesting uh, processes that I want to call out. One is these bad guys, who you're probably all familiar with. Um, the RIA and the MPAA and their like, crazy uh, jihad against the internet in the name of copyright law has actually uh, been, I think, hugely destructive uh, for the way the web got built. And the, the, the subtle thing here is these, these guys look like bad guys to us. But if you're a, a policymaker, if you're a member of uh, the establishment, they are a respected industry that's been around for a long time and has a legitimate claim uh, to representing, or semi-legitimate claim at least, to representing creative people, authors, artists, musicians, uh, who need to get paid for their work. Uh, and these industries have managed to kind of seize all of the mindshare around the idea that we have social institutions that are there to pay authors. And those, that institution, or those institutions are all you know, copyright and its handmaidens, its DRM, uh, collecting societies, all of this infrastructure that we know, everyone here knows, is hopelessly broken. Uh, you know, we can't pay artists and authors in the future using DRM and copyright, and the idea that you could is absurd. Uh, and yet, this bunch of industries has hijacked any conversation about what we might do instead if we were to set out to design good institutions uh, for paying authors. So this is one problem that we've faced politically. The other problem is that people on our side, I think ultimately, technologically and politically, um, looked around at their options, uh, you know, smart people in Silicon Valley, and said, well, there is one way we could make the web that we want to work, the free web. Uh, let's, like, let's just make everything work beautifully and elegantly and make it free, and then there'll just be a small price, a small percentage price in your privacy um, a, 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 so that we can show you ads that'll be very well targeted um, and we can build a beautiful version of the web. And I think that's worked for Google itself, for fa you know, Twitter itself, for, for, for some of those companies, but what it hasn't worked for very well uh, is the web as a whole. And in particular, it's meant that the web as a whole is this tracking mechanism, and we're in this situation where we don't want to live with that privacy invasive web. We do want 
to fund it, we do want good institutions, um, but we don't want the exact version we're, we're, we're living with. So how do we get out of this mess? Um, and I think there are many ways that hackers should be thinking about um, to fix this. And you know, some people are already proposing creative business models, like uh, I think the rise of Kickstarter is a, a great thing for the web. I think the rise of uh, Flatter and other payment methods that you can use to, to send a little payment to the, the, the site you're on uh, is a great development. I think people are talking about ideas like variants of Bitcoin that pay the sites you enjoy reading uh, just automatically when you visit them. Uh, all of these directions for innovation uh, should be pursued. But the one I'm going to talk about today is the simplest, and that is to say, look, we're not going to get rid of the advertising-funded web. Um, it's, it's big and it's producing good things as well as privacy invasion. Let's just make it suck less. Let's figure out a way to have online advertising that isn't quite as demonic as what we've had so far. The strategy is build privacy tools that everyone, not just people in this room uh, who know how to use NoScript or whatever, um, everyone can use them 24-7. They just get installed once and work nicely. They reintroduce the concept of consent. So instead of just browsing around the web and 12 companies get your reading habits or 100 companies get your reading habits, if the price of using Facebook uh, or some other site is that you're you have no privacy on that site, that's a clear negotiation with the user. And they can make a choice about whether that's a price they're willing to pay. Um, this is sort of the rhetoric of the advertising industry today, but it's you know fiction. No one actually consents to third party tracking. Let's reintroduce real consent, uh, informed consent. Um, let's find the best practices that you know some of the less evil advertising companies have out there and make those the minimum flaw for the web and encourage a marketplace where advertising companies actually compete to do better than that. And there are incentives which currently don't exist. You wouldn't know the difference between an ad showed to you by a, a creepy tracking company and a, one that respects your privacy. Let, let's make that actually happen. Uh, so we're going to do this with this browser extension uh, called Privacy Badger. Um, it's going to go out there and find those uh, hypertext cookies and do something about them. Uh, it's going to find the super cookies uh, and track them down and get rid of them um, and implement this, this strategic vision. So along the way, you know, why is writing privacy software hard? Why doesn't this already exist? Um, and a large part of the answer is arms races. You know, we've been telling people as technologists, oh, do something about cookies or do something about this tracking mechanism uh, for decades, actually. Um, and people out there actually hear this slowly. They hear, oh, yeah, I should clear my cookies, and they start doing that. Um, but when you've got an arms race between individuals trying to reconfigure their browsers manually uh, or using you know, one or two of the traditional extensions, and the bad guys who are doing uh, whatever it takes with large engineering teams to track you, the bad guys are going to win. Uh, we actually me did a measurement of one of the mechanisms the bad guys were using in this panopticlick project, which you might have come across. This was a little, uh, this is a little site that's still live that measures the fingerprintability of your browser. The data on the site is a little bit old, but um, what we found in our initial tests of about a million browsers in the course of, of a couple of weeks was that around 90% of the desktop browsers in that sample could be uniquely identified out of a sample of a million just from the configuration and settings information you could read from a web page. So, you know, make a few JavaScript calls to say, you know, what's the screen resolution, what plugins does this browser have, what fonts will it render, uh, and you get back a unique identifier. And so the bad guys who, are, who have all of these tricks, sneaky things they can do to your browser to track you, um, can win this kind of arms race. And you know, our attitude to this is, look, if we have to fight an arms race, uh, Privacy Badger is ready for that. Um, but we'd prefer to live in peace and actually figure out uh, you know, a way to not be fighting arms races, to, to get a policy escape valve from that. Um, so we view do not track as the, the policy part of a solution here. Do not track is a header that your browser can send to a, a website or a third party website saying DNT1, do not track this browser you know, without its permission. Um, and the theory was uh, we can't um, 
solve all of these complicated fingerprinting super cookie problems necessarily, but we can send a clear message to the company saying this user did not consent to being tracked, and then it's a policy uh, obligation on the part of that company to respect it. Now, what we saw, and there's a long and dirty backstory to this, is for a brief moment the US advertising and tracking industry thought about doing this and then settled on the answer that was do not track means pretend not to track. What we will do when we see a do not track header is we will keep tracking you, but we'll stop showing you the creepy ads based on what we know. And, uh, you know, their theory, I think, was well, people can tell when they have creepy ads. Um, and that creates a political problem for us. So we'll try to get rid of the political problem by, by using DNT to identify the, the people who are unhappy about this state of the world, but then we'll still track them. So what do we do about that? Um, that's when we went back to the drawing board and said, okay, um, let's build Privacy Badger. Let's take the uh, pre-existing best defenses that you could use in your browser, none of which were exactly right at the time. Uh, they've gotten a little bit better, actually. But it, 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 I'm going to particularly call out Ghostery as being you know, not really a serious, credible privacy tool. Um, Adblock Plus can be if you configure it correctly. Disconnect is, is the best of these three. Um, we want to do the, you know, the perfected version of this, this vision. Uh, we want the serious badger that's there to protect you, um, but is also ready for peace if, if needed. Um, you know, browser extension for Firefox, um, <laughs> browser extension for Chrome. I, I don't, Chrome's not nearly as cute, but I figured a flying badger on a weird angle is probably the best we can do for that. Um, yeah, look at the Firefox one again. Um, <laughs> Um, strategy is, as, as I mentioned before, we introduce consent. Um, the tactics are block all of the non-consensual trackers. Um, but if a domain promises to honor do not track, then unblock that domain. And how, how do we measure that? Well, we're working on a standard for this. We have a draft on our site you can look at. I actually should have put the URL in here. It's eff.org slash dnt hyphen policy. Um, it's a verbatim text file, a bit like a robots.txt file, but you, you post a verbatim promise that's a strong promise um, saying when we see a do not track header, we will honor it in this specific way that's set out here. Uh, and then that becomes legally enforceable in the United States if, you, if a website does that, makes that promise, uh, the, and uh, violates it, the uh, FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, can go and enforce against that. Or the, in Europe, the uh, European Commission can go and create legal consequences for people promising to honor do not track and, and then lying about it. So we have this way of checking for sites that um, promise to do it right, and then uh, we're creating incentives for them to do that. So Privacy Badger will never block the ads or widgets or third-party stuff of a site that makes this promise. There were three design options we considered for how to do the blocking part. Um, one would be, you know, manual curation along the lines of Adblock Plus, then there's a, an automated centralized version, and then an automated decentralized in the browser version. So the, the first vision is, you work with an open source community and you make an exhaustive list of every tracker you can find. Um, and this sort of works for Adblock Plus, but it involves shipping a canonical list of everything that's considered good and bad on the web. And at EFF, we, we didn't really want to do this if we could avoid it. We didn't want to be in a position of arbitrating for the whole web by hand. Um, the second option would be to run a giant crawler or a set of crawlers uh, across the whole web and try and figure out what things were violating your do not track requests and, and identify those and then ship an automatically generated block list. The third version um, would rely exclusively on, almost exclusively on algorithms in the browser. So it, the browser itself watches what's happening over time, privacy badgers there. Uh, observing third parties in your in your web pages, um, and it automatically blocks them when they appear to be tracking. Now, interestingly, it turned out Internet Explorer 8. I, I don't know if any of you ever used Internet Explorer 8. Um, I, I know I didn't, but uh, uh, it had a feature called in private filtering that would do this. Um, and they actually pulled it both because of lobbying by the advertising industry and because of the fact that when you turned it on, eventually it would start breaking things that were both trackers and necessary for the functionality of pages. A good example of this is 
pages that embed Google Maps. The, the domain that serves the map tiles it sets cookies and tracks you, um, and so it, it, it would get blocked. Um, but you probably didn't want those maps disappearing out of those pages. So we knew from that lesson, that history lesson, that it wouldn't be good enough to just do that. Uh, we said what we'll do is we'll um, include an additional gray list that goes over the top of the algorithm and says if we know about a domain that is like this, we'll, instead of blocking it altogether, we'll block its cookies. Um, and the aim was for this third option to build something that might one day be shippable uh, for the browser, it, for the browser vendors themselves, might be a standard that could be deployed uh, across the web. Um, we had to do some calculations on whether we thought it was feasible to do uh, tracker blocking this way. This is a d data set from um, uh, a paper by uh, Bao and Mayer. My, Jonathan Mayer actually spoke, spoke earlier today. Um, this red graph um, shows the, d the relationship between false positives and success at blocking trackers um, if you do this kind of observation of tracking just from inside a single browser. You know, how many uh, first party sites do I see this third party tracker on? So on this axis you have the, the false positive rate, higher is worse. On this axis you have the um, fraction of tracking that stopped, uh, higher is better. Um, and then the blue line is a uh, more global view. It's a global classifier, like I, I talked about a crawler that you run across the whole web. Um, but we, we, we want to be close to 100 here. So we want to um, we want to be somewhere up in this region, whichever method we use. And then we're going to have to drag ourselves back over to the zero or close to zero false positive rate, and that's what the cookie blocking gray list does. Um, and so then the question was, how many domains would we need to manually gray list in order to get close to zero false positive in practice? The answer seemed to be like a few hundred. So we just set out and we, from this data set, we went and identified those few hundred domains, gray listed them, and then said, okay, we've got a GitHub bug tracker. If people find other things that need to be gray listed, let's just deal with them as they come up. Um, so we're going with this decentralized thing that might one day be part of a browser. Um, we have this gray listing mechanism. It's option two out of this list at the beginning that I showed you. Um, and we've built it. And you can get it at this URL. Now I'm going to try and uh, this may not work. I'm going to try to actually jump over and give you guys a live demo. Uh, we'll see how I go with um, uh, my luck and uh, multiple displays and getting a browser to run here. So we want to, let's try this with, uh, we have a blank directory here. Let's try this with Google Chrome. Uh, you guys actually can't see this, all right. Aha. Uh -huh. Very good, this is promising. So what we're going to do is we're going to run a fresh copy of Google Chrome here. It's going to show up on the wrong screen, so let me get it into the right place. Of course, your browser, the very first thing it wants to do is get your identity and start tracking you, but we're not going to let it do that. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to go straight to the URL I was telling you about and uh, get Privacy Badger. Come on. I'm sorry these fonts are super small, so I'll try and make that a bit bigger so people can see. Okay, so we can install this. So now we have this little button in the corner of the browser. And what's this doing? Um, on this page, it's not doing anything. There's no trackers here. But let's go and look at a, uh, anyone want to name a, a random website on the? On YouTube. YouTube. All right, let's go to YouTube. YouTube's an interesting one because it, it has some third parties in it, but they're all, all sort of basically run by the same company. Um, and what you see right at, the, at the moment is all of these are listed as green because Privacy Badger has no data, no multiple sites that it's observed any tracking across. So let's go to another site. 
Let's go to CNN.com. Uh, they've been, uh, you know, is that the television station that's been playing at us in the, the elevator? Uh, they're talking about plane crashes. Let's look at an article here. Let's go to another tab, slash dot. Because what we want is uh, to see after a little while when Privacy Badger starts seeing you on multiple. Uh, this is talking in the background here. Um, when it starts seeing you on multiple pages, it's going to start saying, wait a minute. Not everything's green anymore. Actually, even within a few pages, you've seen multiple uh, instances of double click trying to cookie you inside those pages. Uh, so, double click is an example of a domain that's been completely blocked. It's just not loading the content from that domain. It's also seen Google.com on several of these. Google, as a third party here, is, is not being blocked because it's often used for API functionality. Instead, it's in this yellow state uh, where it's having its cookies blocked. Um, so Privacy Badger is automatically able to figure out. Let's go to another news site. Let's go WashingtonPost.com. Here on this one, wow, there's a lot of stuff going on in here. This is all still being uh, this is all still being whitelisted because uh, it, it hasn't been observed very much. But let's open like five more tabs and like so youporn.com. Yeah, guys, you want to call them out? Buzzfeed. Buzzfeed. Pornhub. Yep. So what's going on over here? No tracking in 4chan. That's incredibly disappointing. Um, anyway, so I'm going to go back to this Washington Post page we saw a moment ago, and let's see whether anything has changed when we reload it. Um, that giant pile of domains that we saw before. Um, Actually, a lot of this is still green. There are a few things getting blocked. Uh, let's do a few more pages then. Amazon's not very, not very tracky. It's like, like YouTube, the big online companies tend not to have these giant piles of third parties because they run them themselves. Whereas the uh, it's news sites and Where was our BuzzFeed thing up here? Also, what you tend to find is when you click through to an article, you get a lot more tracking. Uh, Gawker.com. We have the Times up here. Let's go back to the Washington Post and open an article. What you'll also notice is that the ads are starting to disappear. Now, F Privacy Badger doesn't explicitly target ads at all. Um, it actually just treats them the same as everything else. It just happens, oh yeah, so we're starting to see that even you know, these trackers that were green before are actually being marked as, as things that are not respecting your do not re track requests. And as I said, it's not targeting ads specifically. It just happens that ads don't respect do not track. They cookie you. When you see an ad on the web, it's actually seeing you and seeing the page you're on and writing that down in a database or in 10 databases. So let's go back to the slideshow. And oh, there's one more thing I want to show you, actually, before I do that. Um, some cool, so all of this you would have seen if you ran the beta version of Privacy Badger. And there are a couple of cool things we've added in the uh, in the um, Sorry, all of this was in the alpha. We've got this beta that's launching. Um, you can actually get it on the site right now, even though it's not labeled as such. Um, so uh, this is not. Let's go to here. If you're blocking a domain, 
this will happen by default. Ah, yes. Um, this is not fully implemented yet. It doesn't. I, we're getting success with one of these widgets here. Um, Privacy Badger is, is starting to incorporate code to recognize these widgets that are things we see everywhere. And of course, widgets like ads see you when you see them, they track you. Um, when Privacy Badger would block a widget in the alpha version, they just disappear. You just lose these widgets on the page. Uh, what we're starting to do is drop in uh, little Privacy Badger versions of the widget. So this is, instead of making the Google Plus widget disappear, if you want to interact with it, um, it turns it into this little button. And if you click that button, it turns into the real uh, Google Plus button. Or with the tweet version, it'll just go to Twitter and open a tweet button for you. So uh, in cases where the functionality and the tracking have been really woven together and it's really widespread, uh, we're starting to deploy a mechanism uh, to let you still have that functionality and turn off the tracking at the same time. Um, but going back to the slides here. I just want to talk a little bit more uh, philosophically about the state of the web. It's sort of an open question about whether we're willing to live with advertising. I think if I actually, if you know, Let's ask this room. How many of you, and maybe it's unfair to do this after this talk, how many of you guys think, well, advertising sucks a bit, but actually it's worth keeping, uh, it's a respectable and honorable way ultimately to pay for stuff that we can give away for free? Can I see hands for that? About a quarter of the room. How many of you say, like, let's just get rid of it? It's actually about a quarter of the room, and the other, I think the other half of you are, like me, somewhat conflicted on this question. Um, or you're not paying attention, one or the other. Um, uh, and so I don't think we have a good answer to whether we want advertising or not. I think we want to let users block it completely if, if they want to do that. Um, but, you know, as a society, we're going to be living with it. Uh, it, it it's not going anywhere. Uh, it's a necessary funding mechanism for a lot of stuff we value. Um, and so in that situation, I think it's non-negotiable that it has to stop violating uh, people's privacy without consent. This is... <laughs> and that's something we think we can deliver with this project. Uh, and you guys can help, actually, by installing it yourselves, um, helping your friends and relatives to install it, and, we, you know, code is on GitHub, if there are things that break, come and tell us about it. Uh, help us build new features. Um, and so I think we're going to get this piece done, um, one way or another. Uh, the other question, and this is a question I want to hear people coming back and give, giving talks about at Hope next year, saying, I built this thing. It's a new business model for the web. Uh, go out and use it. Um, because you guys have the skills to make this happen, whether it's better versions of donations, whether it's, uh, you know, if you're European, actually the Europeans have all sorts of traditions of using public funding to pay for authorship and artistry. Maybe someone in Europe should go and figure out how to get their government to pay for awesome websites. Um, and, uh, you know, there's a lot more that we can explore. Maybe it's those cryptocurrencies that by their nature pay artists as they use. Um, let's investigate this stuff. Let's make the web better. Uh, and remember to, to install Privacy Badger. And I'll take some questions. Hi. Um, so as far as uh, the ad revenue that a lot of sites use, there are plenty of sites like uh, web comics and blogs that wouldn't the, the owners wouldn't be able to have those up without the ad revenue. Um, does how does how does privacy badger affect the ad revenue that they gain when you visit their site if there's tracking in those ads? So what we hope the answer is going to be in a, a month or two is not very much, if at all. Uh, what this is going to take is one advertiser that complies with the do not track policy. And then as soon as there's one advertiser that does that, uh, we can go to all those web comics and uh, online small businesses and say, hey, you were using like advertiser A yesterday. 
uh, and they were tracking your users around the web in a completely creepy fashion. Here is your alternative B. Um, either switch to them or just switch if you see a user who's sending a do not track request. You don't have to do it for everyone. You see a do not track request, um, don't load the JavaScript from the first advertising network, load it from the second one. And so that's what I mean by we want to create incentives for this industry to behave better. Uh, and so we're actually you know, in the process of, of sitting down with some advertising companies that we think are more progressive on these issues and trying to figure out whether any of them are willing to be that pilot uh, for doing it that way. Can Privacy Badger work as a fallback for no script, or how does it respond to a pretty locked down browser, a browser with cookies disabled for certain sites, et cetera? Yeah, so uh, that's a great question. Um, so with uh, no script, it actually plays pretty nicely. I think that uh, as a no script user, at least some of the time myself, I feel like the, the I always want to have an extension that just looks at uh, requests my browser is making and says this subset of requests uh, uh, tracking requests I don't want my browser to be making, throw those away, um, and then what's left, I want to be able to manually white script uh, JavaScript for those. Uh, and so I think that NoScript plus Privacy Badger is a pretty good power user experience. Um, and then in terms of blocking cookies, we had some issues with this in the alpha because the way we were detecting the tracking was, uh, you know, instrumented around API calls uh, that cookie blocking settings in your browser would prevent from happening. Um, we've gotten a little better about that by starting to look at, we can't catch all of the cases, but when you have an incoming um, HTTP response with a set cookie header, you can inspect that. And even though it's never going to set the cookies, you can say, well, it would have set this cookie that would have been a tracking mechanism. So this third party domain is trying to do that. I'll keep a record of that fact. Um, hey, um, I'd just like to say this is my first hope ever and it's like the best. Welcome. Yeah. Actually, uh, I've, I've never seen a room filled with so many intelligent people that desire for the truth. Uh, but yeah, Thanks, everyone. Uh, I mean, this is my question. You know, I'm somewhat of a noob, so to speak, but, you know, that's kind of besides the point. Um, what I want to know is how did you establish and formulate and build your brick road, your yellow brick road to your, I don't know, your affiliation with what it, what it, what it is that you do? How did you build that brick road? And can you give me three uh, functions that you threw into the concoction of the mix of how you formulated of what you're doing now. Okay, sure. Uh, I mean, there are two answers to that question. One is, how did I wind up being a technologist at EFF? Uh, and the short answer to that question was, I think I was, um, you know, there were two moments. You know, one was, uh, I, I'll skip to the second one. I was a, you know, computer science student uh, working on my, my honors thesis, which is like an American senior thesis in, back in Australia. And I uh, was, you know, as, as probably everyone trying to finish a thesis or dissertation of any sort does, I was reloading web pages and I was reloading Slashdot. Uh, and I came across the, the article of, uh, about a guy named John Lech Johansson who had written a video player for Linux and he, um, uh, had you know done this also a D, sorry a, D, a DVD player for Linux and he'd been arrested uh, by the Norwegian government uh, at the behest of the MPAA you know these guys we had on the slide before um, for having done that and I got really angry and I said well actually I, rather than writing code what I really want to be doing uh, is uh, defending uh, the internet against clowns like uh, Mickey Mouse. Um, uh, so, so that was how I ended up, you know, on the road to studying copyright policy and I didn't get that slide. Um, studying copyright policy and working at EFF. And then the question is, how did I end up working on this design uh, for Privacy Badger? And actually, that came from running NoScript and live HTTP headers and other tools for understanding what my browser was doing. And then I kept looking at what they were doing what the browser was doing, what, what the hell, why, why is my browser sending rec information about the page I'm on to a dozen other companies I've never heard of and have no relationship with? And I started to Looks unpack Looks like George that. Soros. Yeah. Yep. Um, 
I started to unpack that and, and wrote a blog post or three about it for EFF, and then that started, you know, uh, the press responded to that, and, and that put us on the yellow brick road, if you like, uh, to Privacy Badger. Yeah. Anyway, thanks for the question. Um, thank you for Privacy Badger. We all appreciate it. Um, My question is, uh, invasive marketing, um, these people, they don't regard us as people. They see us as dollar signs. They just don't give a damn about who we are, okay? So why should we give a damn about them? Why not have, instead of Privacy Badger, grow some fangs and have Privacy Beast? And Privacy Beast basically tinsels them with chef and fills their databases with garbage and short circuits their profit model. Uh, so Privacy Badger is a GPL, it's free software. Um, you can... Thank you. <laughs> Excited to see where this goes in two years. <laughs> uh, I'm sure that you've heard of the, uh, the Epic Privacy Browser. Uh, yep. Yeah, uh, my question is how does a uh, privacy browser, excuse me, privacy badger compare to the, um, uh, to the features that, uh, that Epic has in terms of uh, tracking? Um, so I haven't audited it to compare. I, the, the, thing, the, the versions of this question that I can answer are grocery, uh, adblock plus, and disconnect. Um, uh, in our experience um, of those three, Ghostery doesn't block much stuff by default. Um, uh, in fact, it's, you know, Ghostery is produced by a company that works for the advertising industry. So their, their first function is to figure out what um, trackers are out there on the web so that they can sell that analytic service to those trackers themselves because often sites don't know what trackers they have inside them because some web developer included a, a JavaScript embed and that included five other JavaScript embeds and no one ever figured out what was going on. So Ghostery's primary function in life is to provide that data uh, to the advertising industry and its secondary function is to you know, people who care about privacy can manually go in and make Ghostery start blocking things. Uh, but people who use it a lot tell me uh, that when you really go in and drill down and try and make it block everything, it winds up being too aggressive and, and breaks a lot of stuff. Adblock Plus, by default, doesn't block any invisible uh, JavaScript. So uh, it'll take out all the ads from the page, but unless you go and sub manually subscribe to a different block list than the default, um, you don't get protection against that kind of tracking. And so we wanted something that would just, by default, single click install, get you that result. Um, Disconnect, we actually probably uh, like the, the best of those systems. It's pretty good. Uh, and we've been talking about collaborating with them on the technical pieces of maintaining uh, versions for all the different platforms that are out there because there's quite a lot of engineering work to being on mobile, being on Chrome, being on Firefox, etc. By default, it doesn't block any invisible trackers. So if the page contains like a one by one GIF is the classic version of an invisible tracker, these days that's largely been replaced uh, with JavaScript that's fetched um, and, and does XHR posts back to, to report information about you. That stuff, by default, it doesn't block. Well, when you all get the chance, I'd love to hear a comparison about this versus Epic. I use Epic, but it's unwieldy for certain things, so I'd yep. love to see how this stacks up. All right, we'll do that. Uh, hello, uh, thank you again. Um, I'm a little confused about the way it would retroactively handle cookies. So let's say that a service uh, gives you a cookie and at first Privacy Badger says, nothing fishy about this, that's okay, you can put the cookie there. But then later it starts doing stuff that starts to get mm -hmm. blocked. Does Privacy Badger um, do anything to the pre-existing cookies? Does it stop them from being edited? Yeah. Does it delete those cookies or does it leave that functionality there for the already okay sites? Um, sir, there are, this is a great question. Um, sir, oh, sorry, and a, a follow-up, uh, would the ability to control the way that uh, 
Privacy Badger handles those be in the settings. Yeah. Yep. So uh, what Privacy Badger does, when it sees a third party domain, um, it shows up in that little drop down. Um, and then every time it sees a third party domain, the first question it asks is, in this context, does that domain look like it's tracking me? Um, and so it goes and looks at all the cookies that are in the cookie store for the domain, um, all being set over the HTTP headers. And it says, um, is this cookie, you know, not obviously kosher? And an obviously kosher cookie is something like cookie whose value is one or zero, true, false, lang equals en or some other common language code. Um, those cookies, if, the, if there are cookies like that, it actually does a little entropy calculation for the total set of all of those cookies. And if it's below a, you know, a threshold, it'll say, ah, that's maybe not tracking. Um, but if the cookie is a long random string, like an identifier, a session token, whatever, um, that looks like tracking. And so, it, but you know, sometimes these third-party domains are not really tracking domains. They're just a you know an isolated subdomain that's, that's you know part of a first-party experience. So it keeps a record of how many first-party domains it's seen that third-party and its cookies on. And if it sees it across more than three origins, then it says oh, wait a minute, this thing keeps showing up in different places and it's in a position to know my rating habits not just on one site but on three or more, okay, it's tracking me. So that's what causes the uh, slider to move out of the green state in the browser. Uh, whether it goes to red or yellow, usually by default it'll go to red unless we've gray listed it and said actually we've found documented instances of this domain being necessary for functionality the user wants, in which case we put it into the yellow state, that means cookie blocked. Um, in that state, we just do the third party cookie blocking operation. We try to prevent the domain from getting access to its cookies when it's a third party, but if you go back to that site as a first party, you'll have the cookie again. So an example where you want that is google.com. You know, when you go back to google.com, you may want to be logged in. Uh, to read your, your mail or have a, you know, a logged in experience. So you'll get that, but on the third party context, uh, you'll be logged out of Google. Uh, and then if you want to manually change how Privacy Badger is behaving, you can just grab those sliders in the drop down at any time and manually set them to any of those three states. Green is, is uh, allowed, yellow is cookie blocked, red is completely blocked. And so you can choose how you want it to handle them. Okay, so if there is one, so we all know that do not track is, how should we say, hard to enforce, and great job making software that actually does that. Uh, if there's one thing that we could do to fix the current mess over cookies and tracking, technically do, perhaps as a technical cross-browser standard, because I do work at W3C, what would that one thing be? Okay, cross, the question is, uh, what one change to the web uh, would we want to make as a cross-browser standard to uh, make the web better? And I think, um, you know, we tried that at the W3C. What we would have said was, here's a uh, strong policy document that sites have to comply with um, when they see a DNT one header, because if I don't, if you, and that, you know, thus far has failed at the W3C, we'll see whether we can one day, you know, few years down the track, if, if Privacy Badger and other things like it get enough momentum, um, uh, maybe we can go back and have that conversation again. Um, but the problem is, if, you know, if I can't have that policy solution, I'm stuck with, okay, I have to deal with referrers, cookies, super cookies, uh, fingerprinting, um, all these different tracking mechanisms, and I can't give you a single answer that solves all of those manifold problems at once. Oh. Yes. Oh, hi. Um, so, oh, what does respect for um, DNT like entail? If somebody's tracker wants to be, you know, acceptable to... Uh, that's a great question. Another great question. So, uh, unfortunately, I didn't have the slide on this. I have one minute. Um, uh, if you go to eff.org slash DNT hyphen policy, um, you can read the answer to that question, the one minute version is, uh, if the user's not logged in, 
um, you need to throw away all your unique identifiers for them completely. You know, no cookies that are unique, no super cookies. If they are logged in, um, then you need to not keep those past the time when you've served the resp HTTP response. Uh, and then there's a lot of compromises with reality that are in the document. So it says, yeah, but if you have an explicit transaction that the user is engaged in, like they're about to post a comment, you can keep the data associated with making that comment happen uh, for as long as you need to. And if you uh, have evidence that the user is attacking you, they're launching a security attack or they're engaged in click fraud or whatever, then in specific instances where your systems believe that, you can keep that data uh, without complying with the policy. Oh, but you can't just launder violation of this through third and fourth party, so you're obligated to make sure that if you embed other stuff, it also complies with, with this policy. So basically it's a, you know, about a two to three page document that tries to navigate all of those those things in a way that we think is seriously privacy preserving, but also something that a large scale website could realistically implement. And we've, we've been going around and talking to people uh, and hearing, yeah, this is a hard ask for us, but we think we can do it. I hope you can. Actually, we have uh, this, yeah, I, actually, I, maybe I don't want to say, there are actually some significant websites that you guys use that are now doing this. So uh, we'll be saying more about who they are and doing a big, um, you know, a big press release about it when we have, uh, you know, maybe a dozen of them. Uh, in the orange cookie block state, is it just HTTP cookies that are uh, blocked or not sent, or are there other strong identifiers that are prevented? Um, so that's a, that's a, you know, at the moment we do HTTP cookies and maybe DOM super cookies. We aim to do all of them, uh, but it's development work and we could, we could use pull requests for some of that stuff. Uh, especially anyone who's a really good Flash hacker, we could probably use your help uh, dealing with Flash because it's such a uh, hard thing to control from the browser. All right. Um, I don't think we have more questions. I just want to, like, I think this is on my slides, but I also want to just shout out, I know a number of you are in the audience, um, people who actually helped to write the code for this project. I only did a, you know, a minority of that. Um, Yansu and uh, Cooper Quinton, uh, Franzi Rusner, um, Garrett Robinson, Jonathan May, and Dan Albach. Thank, Thank you all for your help. I'm out of time. It's, it's time for a closing ceremony. Thank you, uh, Hope, for being awesome. And just a reminder, uh, if anybody wants DVDs, um, please place your orders early so we can get caught up on that. Uh, we should be almost caught up before the closing. Thank you. And if anybody's interested, I will be here till like 6 a.m. running disk, so you can always stay around. <laughs>
Johannes. Um, no audio? No audio? No audio. He says we're born. Um, all right. So I get introduced to him. Good evening. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to closing ceremonies for Hope. This is the tenth Hope, twentieth year. It's been okay, huh? Before we get fully underway with the closing ceremonies, I was approached earlier by an elderly gentleman. He asked to say a few words. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, like this first. Ladies and gentlemen, where is, there it is. Turn out the projector, please. Yeah, there. Hello. <laughs> Hello, Yonkers Retiree Club. My name is Dr. Gustav Beuschel. I uh, came from uh, uh, Europe in 1945 uh, for uh, personal reasons. And, uh, <laughs> and today I want to talk to you all about, especially uh, very important here at the Yonkers Retiree Club, uh, about understanding the hacker and its effect on society. Yeah, so let's go on. Uh, this is, uh, by the way, Thank you very much. Uh, this is my, uh, the PowerPoint slideshow was prepared by my grandson, uh, Dr. Matthew Beuschel. And he's a gastroenterologist in Hoboken. Yeah, so, good. Uh, let's go on. Uh, my PowerPoint presentation. 
it. And happy. Introduction content and, and happy. So, uh, uh, a little bit about myself. I am a psychiatrist. Yeah. I'm a psychiatrist. I, I used to study uh, uh, social outcasts. Uh, uh, re, um, the last thing I did was in the 1980s, I did research on uh, live action role playing and uh, I took an arrow to the knee. So that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that pretty much ended my career as a professional. <laughs> Ever since I'm interested in things like 9-11 uh, was an inside job and uh, stuff like that. Uh, the connection of uh, uh, various, various things, I can hardly stand. Uh, I'm a God-fearing person. <laughs> I'm a God-fearing person. Uh, that's what I want to show with this slideshow here. Yeah? And, <laughs> and I, I like entertainment. I'm, I'm very open to certain groups like Blake and stuff. Yeah, okay. So. This is my grandson. Yeah. <laughs> Today I'm here to talk about internet culture. Yeah. What do I mean with internet culture? So, for example, uh, uh, puppies <laughs> and and Gozi. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and. Uh, Of all things, hackers. I'm very interested in this strange subculture of hackers. Uh, and I want to present it to you, my dear friends here at the Retirees Club. So let's go on. Uh, we are all as citizens of the United States of America, which I proudly am. I helped uh, the space program and stuff. It's all okay. Uh, <laughs> we are all targets of mass surveillance. Yeah? Mass surveillance is targeting us like NSA. Uh, the, the, the no such agency and stuff and so uh, what I want to do today is uh, address the problem of talking to hackers because I think we need uh, to talk to hackers to get rid of this mass surveillance especially because I don't know, want that so many things of my past come out yeah so uh, <laughs> So we want to talk to, to hackers, but the main problem with ha hackers is uh, they are targeting the huge data masses. They are targeting uh, what they think is wrong, like surveillance and stuff like that. We have to convince them in a different direction. Uh, and uh, that's what I want to tell you today. So, ah, fuck. <laughs> so, so. Uh, it is actually a song. I do not have uh, any instrument. I cannot play an instrument. Uh, I also couldn't find anyone to play an instrument for me. So, so uh, ex except my um, other grandson who is in the basement. So, so uh, okay. So let's try it. This is the song. Okay. <laughs> it's based on an old Viennese uh, uh, folk song. Beep. Well, the world is a dismal place. They monitor every step. They're online and offline and in your face. The Freemasons are just a hip. <laughs> and for what thing, for threat and straightly our facts to the Illuminati. They hide in the cookies as internet cash. Golly gosh, that is fresh. <laughs> so. Yeah. I, I have ten more. So, uh. chorus. <laughs> when I see a surveillance device anywhere, I shatter it with my cane. I, and if they replace it, cause they are not aware, I'll shatter it with my cane. And if then at some point they grasp it, all these electronics are vast shit. We want the police back and guard and in charge. Nobody does it like Sarge. <laughs> this is basically my message. We have to replace all security technology by police officers. You know? 
because we can't trust humans, we cannot trust machines. You know, that's what I learned in the Third Reich. Uh, so, okay. So, there. Ah, uh, yeah, one more. It, uh, you'll lack Olive Garden's Alfredo sauce. Well, the NSA already knew. They collect all our data just there because with electric machines, yes, it's true. For the data retention principle, you need honest guys. It's that simple. The NSA is the new KGB. This doesn't sound funny to me. So, ah, it's good. <laughs> I mean, uh, let me let me summarize. Uh, uh, policemen need fresh air. They need to patrol and to get out of the cathode ray tubes. No security, no cybernetics. We claim situational ethics. I'm looking for freedom, but not like the Hof. These cameras turn me off. I, I like that very much. So. It, it doesn't end. Uh, what have I created? Uh, Atari PC Pet 2000. These hackers are hacking with every brand. They want you to stand with your back in the wall. That's why we should shatter them all. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, my wife, my dog, Michelle Foucault, and the Rotary Club in Sleepy Hollow. Bye bye. Well then, <laughs> I'm told that um, discounted airfares to Austria are uh, very popular these days and uh, Johannes is one of the saner people over there so it's a very interesting place to, to go. <laughs> well we did it, we're uh, at the end and uh, this has been the most awesome one yet, right? We'll, we'll have uh, more people speaking about particular things, but I just really, I, I want to um, definitely recognize uh, the efforts of AV in this particular um, uh, conference. It has been phenomenal. <laughs> Maya, Adam, all of you. I'm blown away. Just, just for what you guys accomplished yesterday, uh, getting Edward Snowden, um, getting the connection going, we heard from people at South by Southwest who had done this, that, we did so much better as far as getting it to work, which is always good to hear. Um, and of course, uh, there are so many efforts, uh, people here to say a few words about various things that have gone on. Um, one of the things I really want to um, uh, recognize uh, is the network itself, because the network is something unprecedented here. We had 50 megabit in uh, 2012, and um, we weren't sure. A, a, a few weeks ago, we, you heard about the whole thing with the distributor. We were having all kinds of financial issues, and we weren't even sure we were going to be able to get the same net connectivity. We were thinking, you know, we we're having conversations. It's not really about the network, right? People can come here and just watch the talks. That, that'll be fine, right? No one's going to complain. And, <laughs> yeah, well, you know. Um, and, and just, you know, when things were um, at their darkest, um, Kyle here, who uh, set up the network, decided that he was going to go out and get an even better network than we had before. And that's how we wound up with a network 200 times faster just when we thought we couldn't do it at all. And that's the hacker spirit, right? <laughs> this is the guy to thank for this. This is Kyle, and uh, he's got some people to thank. Hi there.
Um, I could tell a lot of really amazing long stories. Um, we were kind of up and down. Uh, I wanted to do this um, uh, from the start, bring in uh, our own line, and, and we've had a standing offer um, with Hurricane for a while, but we've never been able to make it happen. Um, and it, it was getting really close. We had some problems um, getting permission with the hotel, and um, the, obviously the uh, management situation has been changing a lot here lately. Anyway. Um, Fast forward, the contracts, nothing was really happening. It didn't, people weren't talking and we weren't getting permission to uh, do the microwave fast enough. And I got really frustrated with how long that was taking because we had like a month to go. Um, so I, um, I made a, an inquiry to the people at RCN and then I reported back to my network team which is freaking amazing. You're gonna meet um, pretty much uh, the core guys and, and a lot of them in a minute. Um, anyway, uh, and we'll dis discuss in detail exactly how that went down. Um, so basically, in the last month, uh, we got the right people together, and it was a, a really interesting coincidence of um, certain people getting involved and getting the right people talking. Um, uh, I'm really just interested. People have asked me, so what is your interest in leading the NOC? Uh, what is your interest in, in doing this? And I've said, well, uh, I'm a hacker. I'm really interested in this stuff, and I'm not really doing this uh, regularly, but I know enough about it, and I'm interested enough to um, think of an idea like and push it forward. So that was really my goal, but I knew I needed a lot, a, a ton of help to do it. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, I'm not going to get into absolutely like all the details of how those communications went and what it took, so because um, I I think the guys are going to lay it out uh, pretty clearly what we ended up with, but um, we eventually worked with uh, RCN and got a patch, and um, then it was um, weeks of uncertainty about uh, permission and exactly what the hotel would allow us to do. Um, anyway. I, again, it's, it's really, it took a long time and I was really uncertain and frankly scared to death that um, I was going to disappoint and well, we, we have a whole new core in the, uh, in the NOC and uh, it's, it's a whole new team and that itself was really odd because I was creating teams with people that I hadn't met and that probably hadn't met each other. Um, so that additionally uh, made it kind of uh, really nerve-wracking. Uh, nerve so. Um, without further ado, I'm just going to thank uh, everybody I could think of in the last couple of days when, uh, in between doing other stuff and then um, the rest of the story I think we're going to share with you during our presentation. So um, first off, I'd like to thank Emmanuel for uh, believing in me and letting me kind of run with the ball and see what we could do. Um, I'd also like to thank McFly, he couldn't be here, but he uh, helped set up uh, a lot of other connections. I'd also like to... Uh, people connections to get talking to the right people and get us moving. Uh, Winnie also helped a lot with the design. It's not necessarily uh, network stuff, but he was uh, very involved remotely um, from Germany. And uh, on a related note, Niels uh, from the CCC and the C3 NOC in general. Um, they, a uh, good friend of mine, uh, put out a, an inquiry over uh, Twitter and stuff like that, and they actually talked about it and came up with, uh, well, what they could do. And to that end, um, uh, Attila, who you'll meet in a second, uh, was able to communicate with me and sort out stuff uh, with wireless and a lot of other core stuff that we put together. Um, I'd also like to thank Dragorn, who is our previous knock lead. He did a fantastic job um, doing a write-up of what he'd done in the past, and we were able to use that as a template and take the good from it and then improve on uh, what we thought was feasible. Um, also, uh, let's see, uh, Nick God helped a lot, uh, and there's uh, an another um, whole batch of people from our uh, group that uh, I just didn't have time to, to add. I'd also like to thank Roach and Dragos and Jacob and a lot of his friends and, uh, and some of the other guys that just showed up as volunteers. Um, also the knock pool, they helped us out a lot uh, as far as uh, coordinating another set of access points. We got half from um, uh, uh, Cisco and then we got the other half from knock pool. Um, and uh, Nick Farr helped out with that. He helped uh, fund a little bit of the deposit for that. That was good. Um, also, I'd like to thank Fernando and the, the staff here at the hotel. Uh, they gave us a tip about there being dark fiber in the building. And that was here, that was installed here for a fucking Super Bowl, Super Bowl party 
or press room or some stupid shit like that. And um, they don't even know what the fuck they have, uh, and they don't even know the difference between single mode and multi mode. But um, I really appreciate their help. <laughs> Building on that, um, I'll mention Cisco again, RCN, Zach at Yellow Fiber Networks. Uh, Jim at NAC.net and a lot of others. Um, uh, also, our un unnamed wireless provider for uh, pissing me off and being uh, sort of incompetent and being a good backup. Um, Rainbow! <clears throat> um, also, everyone who listened to me talk about network shit for a year, I'm sorry. Uh, I really wanted to get this right. So, um, thank you very, very much for that. Uh, Emmanuel's definitely in that, in that crew. Um, all the volunteers who showed up and helped, especially Lindsay, she directed people to me based on their interests, and that helped me build out the teams. <laughs> also, uh, and lastly, every single one of you who attended and uh, politely had your fun and uh, otherwise misbehaved. So thank you. Uh, as I said, uh, I could go on, we could talk about the future, we could talk about what we're going to do, but I'd really like to relish the moment and be, um, well, really thrilled at um, the precedent we've set because, um, well, I think it can only improve from here. Uh, and I'm really honored to have uh, been able to lead and, and, and have met a lot of new people that I think are going to stick around, especially, and, and including the providers. Um, I'd also like to thank, uh, well, Daily Dot and Mandrill helped uh, allow, uh, out uh, financially to Mandrill a uh, big time because we eventually got the cost of patching it uh, and connecting it uh, paid for. So that's pretty cool because it was essentially free. <laughs> So, uh, those are all the people I could think of. I know there's a ton more people. I'm really, really sorry. I just, I... <laughs> I had a lot of shipping to do. We had a pallet stacked up in the warehouse. You know, it was a really busy time. You know, we, we had all the equipment coming in. It was really, hey, the Amazon, we had all these packages. <laughs> Shut up, Louie. Um, <laughs> So anyway, with that, I would like to introduce um, our current knock team and do a really cool presentation on what the fuck actually happened. Hi, everybody. So um, I first got to say the, uh, the intro uh, was fantastic. Uh, covered a lot of the bases. Uh, I'm going to go through really quick just some of the background of uh, you know what exactly we did here, how we were able to pull off bringing 10 gig to you, um, and help you push more bandwidth. So our start, uh, as Kyle was saying, uh, we were asked, uh, well, he asked uh, the C CCC uh, or C3 NOC a month prior to Hope if they could assist with running the network this year. Uh, Attila and uh, Fico reached out to myself. Uh, two weeks prior to the conference uh, to get help with the core and connectivity issues that they were facing. Uh, in less than two weeks, uh, seven business days to be exact, we managed to get 10 gigs of connectivity established to the Hotel Pennsylvania. Pretty cool. So I, I would definitely call that a miracle. Uh, I've never seen telcos work so fast. <laughs> Uh, the coordination that took place in order for that to occur, uh, we got 10 gig of transport connectivity from RCN uh, to 111 8th Avenue, uh, which is the Google Data Center uh, and Equinix. Uh, we got a cross connect between RCN and HE. Um, we got 10 gig transit sponsored by Hurricane Electric. Uh, we had to get LOAs in from two different service providers in order to get the IP space that we needed to run the network and we had to get an IPv6 allocation from Hurricane Electric. Uh, special thanks to Reed at Hurricane and Peter at RCN for really pulling the strings to make the telcos move quick. <laughs> this is quite possibly the most exciting piece. Uh, so this is our very own dark fiber. Uh, it's scalable up to 100 gig in the future. 
uh, if you can use it. Or disappointed, you didn't use enough bandwidth. <laughs> so the hardware requirements to pull this off. Um, our core router and distribution were received last minute due to the sudden, sudden change of requirements and uh, actually going to 10 gig on such short notice. Um, literally, we received the last of the equipment uh, the morning before the conference, uh, thanks to Cisco and Yellow Fiber. Uh, core router distribution and optics were provided by Yellow Fiber. The wireless controller, optics, and access points were provided by Cisco and Knockpool. In terms of uh, our IP space, we got a slash 19 uh, for, uh, from RIPE uh, through Falco Networks, and we got a slash 23 uh, in the Aaron region from Sliqua. Uh, we also got a 48 of V6 uh, with some Easter eggs hidden in, uh, if any of you picked up on it. Um, so the hex to ASCII for our uplink interface to Hurricane uh, says 2014 Hope. <laughs> Back to planet! And the actual allocation has 2600 in it as well. Uh, the network core, uh, we had a Brocade XMR 4000 backbone router, which is capable of up to 960 gigabits, uh, populated with 80 gig of optics uh, ready for consumption. Um, we turned up five of those eight ports this weekend. Um, the distribution switches on MES and 18 were connected at 10 gig. Uh, the distribution switch on six was unfortunately connected at one gig because we ran out of hardware. Well, to be fair, we were supposed to have a 10 gig switch and it was not. Yes, oh, that is well, true. It was 10 gig, but we didn't have the right ad adapter. Yeah. So uh, this was during the Snowden talk. Uh, we had to put a fan directly next to the core. Uh, it got a little crazy. <laughs> uh, this was our distribution up on the 18th floor. Uh, so we had three, three switches up here. Uh, the buildup of the network, uh, fiber service uh, <laughs> was uh, completed on Wednesday night. Uh, Attila, Fico, and myself uh, all came out and uh, we tested with a light meter, which uh, revolved some silliness um, because where it was delivered was like right in the middle of a ballroom and they had an event going on the next day. So we literally had to hide the fiber up in the uh, crown molding. <laughs> to go down the hallway. Oh, God. That, that was horrible. <laughs> uh, the rest of the network uh, was actually completed in one night. So I have some pictures of, uh, you know, the, the equipment that was involved with actually making this happen and, you know, how it came in. So a couple of uh, pallets from 2600's warehouse. That, that was, that was, uh, that was Louie. <laughs> we had free cat five it's all gone <laughs> yep all gone uh and the core and distribution were actually delivered uh with radio statler on wednesday uh we needed uh, a couple of bell hops to help us i think it cost us like 50 dollars just to get it to our hotel room uh for the night so that was fun uh that's uh actually our tag for the rcn circuit that actually says hope x on it pretty cool uh, this is fiber dangling from the uh, from the D mark, yeah. advertising the connectivity. Uh, hooking up a light meter, uh, you can kind of see the fiber over here. This is when we were initially running it down the hallway, and then we were advised that there was going to actually be an event the next day. So at the very top there, uh, there's some crown molding. We had to move it further up and actually like tape it into there. Uh, so. When it was all said and done, it looked like nothing was there. Uh, this is uh, Attila picking up the uh, WAPs from Cisco. Uh, this was actually the morning of setup. <laughs> this is uh, about half of the WAPs that we have. Um, <laughs> Attila with some uh, much needed coffee. Uh, we were up for around 24 hours at this point. Coffee wasn't enough. Yeah, coffee was not enough. We actually had to get some Club Mata as well. It, it was a rough night. Yeah, oh my God, Thursday. <laughs> Need I say uh, more? I think, I think there was ethanol involved as well. Maybe some. <laughs> Hot 
fact is that we got the core network online and we got 18.4 online 20 minutes before the conference started. <laughs> and I was still there fucking punching cable. <laughs> So obviously, you know, this is a very interesting hotel from a cabling perspective. Uh, the only patch panels happen to be on the mezzanine, and uh, that cabinet is locked. So we had to have some lock pickers open it for us. So we were able to connect the lobby, mezzanine, third floor, sixth floor, and 18th floor. Uh, that's never been done before. We've never had uh, connectivity uh, on our network on the sixth floor as well. So this is uh, an expansion as far as uh, where in the hotel we had service. So that's excellent. So we ran, in order to make this happen, 850 meters of fiber, 7,000 feet of copper with another 7,000 to spare. And we had to rerun the connectivity from the mezzanine to the 18th floor three times. It was even approved by the Australian government. If you don't believe me, ask security. <laughs> so just to put the, the amount of fiber in perspective, 850 meters of fiber is 27, 88 feet. And just how tall is that? Unfortunately, last night at 3.08 a.m., the fiber from the mezzanine to 18th floor was cut maliciously. A handful of the NOC team uh, spent four hours rerunning it. Uh, unfortunately, it wasn't on spindles, so they literally had to just drag fiber down the, <laughs> and it all got caught up. Uh, it took about two hours to untangle. So that was the third time that that cable was rerun. I believe, I believe that's like a compound fracture. Yep. Uh, yeah, it looks like a key. That or a gerbil ate it. <laughs> so in terms of wireless access points, we had 49 access points on site. Uh, 34 of them were deployed. Uh, we would have deployed more, but we were looking for hotspots, and you guys didn't use enough bandwidth. So. <laughs> Uh, some interesting stats. 39.5% were on encrypted Wi-Fi. I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> Hello, Chris Kringle. 42% were on 2.4 gigahertz, which according to Attila is uh, actually pretty good. It's better than on the CCC, so if you have a device that doesn't support 5 gigahertz, try to buy one. <laughs> It might work better on conferences. We had uh, 2,785 unique wireless clients. Uh, we had Chris Kringle uh, actually attend Hope this year, uh, as did the quote unquote government. <laughs> Two users found themselves uh, as awesome. And uh, we found one fuck knock user, um, but we didn't catch that one in time. Uh, breakdown by manufacturers on the wireless. We cannot talk about what my username is. Top 10 usernames. <laughs> By the way, you could have used any username and password combination, so. <laughs> Users on the network, uh, we had 3,000 uh, or so attendees, speakers, et cetera. Um, 6,921 unique DHCP requests, uh, so about two times the number of users. Um, and the most traffic utilization occurred as a result of people actually using the network uh, during the Snowden talk uh, for streaming. Uh, and you can see, actually see that on the graphs and you can see that it will continue. <laughs> so we about doubled the amount of traffic we did post Snowden talk as a result of that. Our peak was 1.5 gig and out of 10. No one got dropped. Uh, one thing is uh, we really wanted a lot of resources I'd, I'd spoken about, uh, yeah, wanting to expand and grow, and I knew the seriousness of a lot of what was going on would make it important to have resources, but the way we were doing streaming and the way we were, um, well, basically crowded and uh, needing to have simulcast, 
Um, well, we really wouldn't have been as successful as we were if we hadn't had uh, the bandwidth we did, because a lot of that stream was coming from the internet. So um, oh. it was really, really useful that yeah. we had this. And well, you can see uh, it there. Actually, I want to give big props to Cisco, because they loaned all the access points we had that made it for all, everyone who was on wireless. They loaned us like, what was it, uh, 40 or 50 access points? We just said it all. Yeah, yep. we, we covered that. <laughs> So just to give you an idea of the, the power of the Knox staff and how many of, their, of us were watching the uh, Snowden talk, uh, making sure that stuff was continuing to operate, uh, this is a, a small picture. <laughs> Hurricane Electric uh, engineers were on site during the live stream to ensure that nothing would interrupt it. Uh, again, thanks to Reed and his crew. 